We have made it to the trade deadline here in the Miami Marlins franchise here on MLB The Show 23. And I think this deadline in particular puts us in an interesting spot. Over the last few years, we really built for last season to be the year that we win the World Series. Obviously, we didn't do that. We lost a lot of guys in free agency. And while we have had young players replace their production, we have a lot of holes on our roster. And this is the best opportunity to patch them. We have had guys underperform. We've had guys getting hurt, including most recently, rookie shortstop Adiel Amador, who's been put on the 60-day IL. So presumably, this team needs to add at least one more bat, probably two. The starting rotation's been inconsistent, although there isn't like a clear weak link here. And then the bullpen as well. There's nobody in particular who has been really bad, but we definitely could look to make this unit of our team a little bit stronger. So we have to be aggressive here at this year's trade deadline. It's pretty simple. We need to get two or three impact players, maybe not necessarily superstars who we give the house for, although given the opportunity, maybe that is a route we go with. And there are some intriguing players who are available, especially on the trade block. And we've got the assets in the miners to potentially make a big move if we need to. Looking at the trade block, obviously the name that pops out is Eli De La Cruz in Detroit. He's had a career year. He made the all-star team. He has a war already above five. Now, if we want to get him, it would cost a lot. Itoki Nomo and Kevin Alcantara would headline the package. I think that's too much for a guy who has a year and a half left of team control, who hasn't really been a star until this year, especially with some of the other guys we've got here. Augustine De La Cruz was another guy I would have looked at, but he was just traded to the Giants. So he's off the market. I did some more searching. I think Brian Hayes from the Pirates could be pretty interesting. Good defensive player. Hits lefties well. And he's on a cheap contract for the next two and a half seasons. I also wanted to take a look at the Cardinals because they've offered us a lot of trades involving their crowded infield. Nolan Gorman's been the guy they've been trying to ship off. And Nolan Gorman's a really good player. But he's very redundant with a lot of the skill sets we already have. I think somebody like Luis Rangifo who the Cardinals would probably rather give up because he's worse and older, could make more sense. He mashes against left-handed pitching, and we need more guys that can do that. This trade would be a Rangifo alec Bohm swap. I don't think this really makes sense for the Cardinals. Why trade an expiring infielder for another one, especially when you're kind of out of the playoff picture? So we're going to make another deal here with Luis Rangifo, giving away three prospects, including starting pitcher Sandy Gaston, a reliever Orlando Ortiz Mayer, who's kind of a throw-in, and then first baseman Oswaldo Matias. He is the prize of this deal for the Cardinals. He's a good first baseman who's had an unbelievably good season in the minors for us, but I think it's worth it to get Luis Rangifo, help take the load a little bit off of Khalil Watson, and get us another good infielder. This means we don't really need Cattell Marte anymore because we got our lefty masher. Obviously, Cattell Marte is a guy I really like. He's been around the channel for a while. I just don't really think we need him, though. We're going to give him to the Orioles for outfield prospect Simon Muziati. He's 29 years old and realistically, probably not a long-term piece of the future, but he is some solid outfield depth for a guy who we don't need and probably would be DFA'd. I think Luis Rangifo is a good starting point, but we need another bat, particularly an older veteran who's been around the block, somebody who's 35 plus years old and wouldn't cost that much to get. I went through the player finder and the name who popped out to me was Josh Bell, another guy who always seems to end up on my teams on this channel. He was obviously a stud in the MLB The Show 20 series with the Pirates. We had him last year with the Guardians franchise. He's had a really good season this year with, ironically, the Cardinals, who we just got Rangifo from. But they sent him down to the minors. I don't really know why. And the reason is because they've put him on waivers entirely. This feels like a no-brainer waiver claim for us. Josh Bell's a guy I'd be willing to give up a decent prospect or two for. And we're not even going to need to, assuming nobody else claims him. And hopefully we're able to land him as a big-time bench bat who can be a major player for us down the line the rest of the way. I also wanted to acquire a reliever, particularly somebody who we don't really have to give a lot for, and I think Phil Bickford would be the perfect addition. He's had a career year with the Angels, and I want to capitalize on that. He really hasn't been all that good of a player before this season, so I'm kind of banking on him continuing to play this well. And of these trades in the trade finder, I think I'm going to do this deal, which would send away catching prospect Will Banfield. He had a really good season in double A. We called him up to triple A. He hasn't been as good. He's already 28 years old. He's not some crazy good prospect, but the Angels don't really seem all that interested in keeping Bickford. So I'm not complaining. I'll take him. We do need to send somebody down now. And unfortunately, it's going to be Paul Seawald. 
there wasn't really an obvious pitcher for us to send down, and Seawalt's definitely a guy I would expect to be on the roster in October, but for now, he's going to go down to AAA. So, with the addition of Luis Rangifo and Phil Bickford, and hopefully Josh Bell within the coming days, I feel like we had a pretty successful trade deadline. We didn't mortgage any great long-term pieces like we have with other recent trades within the last year or so, such as acquiring MJ Melendez in the offseason and Johan Duran last year at the trade deadline. For now, Rangifo will be the everyday third baseman, replacing Jacob Berry, essentially. Barry's really struggled offensively. A lot of the attention has gone on to Alec Bohm, who hasn't had a very good season, and that's led to Jacob Berry getting significantly more playing time. And he's been a massive disappointment, in my opinion. So both Bohm and Barry are in the doghouse for right now, and Luis Rangifo is going to be the regular starter there. Hopefully, those additions are going to help us within the NL playoff race. We are currently leading the Phillies, but not comfortably in the division, only by two games. And we have a four-game series upcoming against them. And then we play them one more time in September. So I'm going to hop into this first game. Edward Cabrera, unfortunately, does not pitch in any of the four games, which really is not ideal. So we're going to really need to win this first game because the only starting pitcher who I have a good amount of trust in right now is Casey Mize. He's played very well over the last couple of months, and hopefully he's going to be able to keep it going against a loaded Phillies lineup that includes Trey Turner, Bryce Harper. Juan Soto. They just acquired Drew Jones at the deadline from Arizona as well. So here's Casey Mize, who quietly has been having a really good season in my opinion, and he's given us a lot of consistency as our number two starter. He'll lead off the ends against Trey Turner, the talented shortstop in his sixth season with the Phillies, and he goes down on the curveball. Now against Bryce Harper, who's missed much of the year with injury, but is back and he strikes out on the fastball. Casey Mize is not a strikeout guy, but he's punched out two, looking to retire this side here against Juan Soto, and he lines it to first. It's snagged by Isaac Stew. Good start for Casey Mize as we take a look at Andrew Painter, who really has broken out for the Phillies over the last couple of seasons. A big-time pitching prospect. We've seen the flashes of upside with Painter, but I feel like he's really turned into one of the better starters in the league now. And the Phillies have a major asset with him at the top of the rotation, along with other good players like Zach Wheeler. Kevin Alcantara leads things off, and he does with a bang. Rips it into right center. Not quite enough to go over the fence, but it will be a double. Kevin Alcantara's development this season has been a big part of why this team has played really well over the last couple of months. He's legitimately been one of our best players since the start of May. That'll bring up Jazz Chisholm, the current NL MVP frontrunner, and he rips this one into the left center gap. That one will bounce in front of the wall and easily score Alcantara. An RBI double for Jazz Chisholm, and the Marlins offense is on the ground running. They lead it 1-0, looking for more. That'll bring up Isaac Stu, who has continued to hit the ball at an elite level. Checks his swing. The umpire says he went around. That pitch was well inside. Stu wanted to be aggressive. And, well, it backfires. That'll bring up Woody Landry, who quietly has had a really nice month of July, and his numbers really are not that far off of Jazz and Stews. He's going to go down on the changeup, though. A great pitch by Painter, who now will face off against Jesus Sanchez, who hasn't hit for the power that we would have hoped for, but he's drawn a ton of walks. He's playing great defense, and overall has had his best and most well-rounded season of his career, but he grounds out to first, and the former Marlin, Rowdy Telez, makes the play. Speaking of Rowdy, he will lead off the top of the second, and he's going to look to start strong as he hits it well into center. I feel like Alcantara could have made a play on that ball, but instead he lets it bounce in front of him for a base hit, and the Phillies get a runner aboard. Drew Jones, in his Phillies debut, strikes out on the curveball. The Phillies gave up Bryson Stott for him, who was an all-star starter. They clearly believe in Drew Jones, who will join Justin Crawford in what is a crowded Phillies outfield. Crawford hits it into left center. That'll go for a double. Rowdy Telez could have scored if he wasn't a complete snail on the bases, but he is, and he doesn't score. Matt Willard will be intentionally walked. Got to set up the force out here at all bases. And so now they are loaded for how you lead. He hits it well into right field. More than enough room to drive in the run off the sacrifice. As Jesus Sanchez comes down with it, Telez will score. Crawford makes it to third. And the Phillies tie it at one. A successful at bat for Lee. And now the Phillies have a chance to add to the lead. Runners on the corners for Rafael Marchand, who goes down looking on the curveball. Casey Mize with a handful of strikeouts already. I think he's at four. 
Again, he's not a strikeout guy, but he's getting a lot of punch outs early. Bottom two, one away. Luis Rangifo in his first at bat as a Marlin. Strikes out on the fastball. Good pitch there by Painter. Clocking in at 97 as we move into the third. Trey Turner swings and misses at the high fastball. That would have been a walk, too. And obviously, we know Turner is a big threat running the bases. That'll bring up Bryce Harper. Count even at 1-1. One and, one, and he hits this one up the middle. Watson cannot quite make the play. And that'll go for a single. And the Phillies get a runner aboard here with one away. And that'll bring up Juan Soto. He hits this one well into the opposite field. Wood chasing after it as it bounces over the wall. Probably the best thing that could have happened there. Otherwise, I think Harper would have scored. Rowdy Telez now rips this one into right field. That will go all the way to the wall. His second hit of the game. Both runs will score with no problem. And the Philadelphia Phillies take a 3-1 lead. Casey Mize has thrown a lot of strikeouts, but he's allowing a lot of hard contact. Drew Jones goes down on the slider. Strikeout number six for Mize. He'll face off against Justin Crawford now, looking to get another punch out, and he does. Crawford goes down looking. This is a very uncharacteristic game for Casey Mize. He doesn't allow a lot of hard contact, but he doesn't throw a lot of strikeouts. Today, it's been the total opposite. He is seven through three innings, but when the Phillies are putting the bat to the ball... They're succeeding. Bottom three, Wood with a grounder to short, and Trey Turner botches it. That'll go for an error. And so James Wood is aboard to start the inning, and the Marlins have an opportunity to potentially bring themselves back in it, trailing by two or not. Alcantara grounds it to short. Turner's slow to make the play, but it is a 6-4-3 double play. The error proves to be meaningless, and we go top four. Matt Willard leads things off, grounder to short. Watson misplays it now, and that'll be ruled as an infield single. I feel like Khalil Watson would have made that play had he not, you know, missed the ball. So I'm a little bit surprised they didn't call it an error, but instead a hit. How you Lee strikes out in the curveball. Another K for Mize. That is his eighth of the game. Rafael Marchand rips it into the gap. That one's going to make it all the way to the wall, and that will potentially score another run as he rounds third, looks to head home. That's Willard. He is safe. And the Phillies lead it 4-1. to one. What is happening with Casey Mize? It's a two-outcome scenario. A strikeout or a hit. Here's another one. Trey Turner with a single. Trey Turner looks so slow in this game. I don't know why. Is he aging that poorly? And now Mize is going to be removed from the game. What a weird showing from Casey Mize, who struck out eight batters. However, of the other ten guys who have put the ball in play, eight of them have ended up as base hits. When the Phillies have not struck it out, they're 8 for 10 today. Into the game for Baez will be Reynaldo Lopez, who's going to look to pad the bleeding. The Phillies are up by 3. They have two runners on the corners. This game could get catastrophic quickly if things don't start to get moving. And sure enough, Bryce Harper rips it into the gap. Lopez's first at bat of the game. Both runners on base will score, despite a good relay to try to get Turner. And now it's 6-1. to one in favor of Philadelphia. They look unstoppable right now. Two away for Rowdy Telez. He strikes out on the fastball. And so the Marlins get out of the inning, but they are in trouble. They trail by five runs. The pitching has really not been good, but they're getting a lot of strikeouts at least. Not that it's mattered. We're getting killed. Let's see if the offense can do anything. Obviously started off strong, but haven't really done anything since the first. Isaac Stu goes down looking. His second strike out of the game. Good pitch by Painter. Two away now in a full count for the right fielder. Jesus Sanchez. He hits this ball high and deep in a left field. At the track. At the wall. It is caught. I thought that one had enough carry, but unfortunately not. As Juan Soto comes down with it. The Marlins still without a hit since the first inning. As the Phillies are in clear control of this game. Looking to cut the division lead to one. More hits aplenty here in the top of the fifth as Drew Jones starts things off with a single into left field. Once upon a time, Drew Jones was looked at as an elite prospect, second overall pick by the Diamondbacks, largely because of this. He can run as he ends up stealing second. The Phillies have a lot of big-time base-stealing threats on their roster, another one being Justin Crawford, who goes down looking on the fastball, the son of the former Major League All-Star outfielder Carl Crawford. And then Matt Willard! Crushes this ball in the left center. That one is gone. And it's now 8-1. to one. The Phillies offense continues to explode. 
Of all the balls put in play, again, only two of them have gone for outs. And one of them was a sacrifice fly. That's just crazy to me. Reynaldo Lopez has not done any better than Casey Mize. He's going to be yanked out of the game and will be replaced by the all-star Camilo Duvall, who's had a phenomenal season out of the bullpen for us. And hopefully he can look to pad the bleeding because this game, I mean, the score tells it all. How you Lee up the middle, base hit. The hits are just going to keep on coming for the Phillies. Their lineup looks like the murderer's row Yankees right now. The way they are just crushing the ball and quickly making it through the lineup. With two away, Trey Turner, single in to left. Another base hit for the Philadelphia Phillies. Two on, two outs for Harper. This ball's put in play, but it will not be a hit. Oh my God, I cannot believe it. It's a grounder to first. Isaac Stu makes the play. But another big inning for the Phillies. They had two more. Off of the homer by Willard, and it's 8-1. to one. The Marlins, meanwhile, still have not gotten a hit since the bottom of the first inning. The offense is looking lost. Melendez strikes out. Here's Luis Rengifo. He hits this one over to short. What a play by Turner. Throw to first in time. An incredible defensive play by Trey Turner, making up for the error earlier. Rengifo can only watch in awe. Khalil Watson's now up. He's behind 1-2, and two, and he strikes out on the high fastball. Andrew Painter continues to look brilliant. I know the story's been the Phillies' offense, but Painter looks awesome. Speaking of awesome, Juan Soto, he's got a pretty awesome bat. Launches it into right field. That'll go for a solo shot, and it's now 9-1 to one in favor of the Phillies, his 20th of the year. Duvall looking to pick it up as he fools Drew Jones on the low cutter. Crawford now rips it into right over the head of Jesus Sanchez. The Phillies continue to be a two-outcome team. A uh, base hit, particularly an extra base hit, or a strikeout. That still has not changed. Here's Matt Willard into the gap. That'll score Crawford, and it is now 10-1. to 1. Can anybody stop this offense? Mize couldn't. Lopez couldn't. Even Camilo Duvall, who's been one of the most effective pitchers in all of baseball. He couldn't. So Joe Shearer will come into the game out of the bullpen. ERA of zero in just under 13 innings this year as he walks how you Lee. And he will strike out Marshawn on the splitter. Successful inning, though, for the Phillies. They had two more runs. They yank another pitcher. And they lead 10-1. to 1. This game is continuing to go south fast. The Marlins, meanwhile, still have not gotten a base hit since the first inning. And finally, it looks like Kevin Alcantara will change that as it goes off the wall in right field. That'll end up as a double. Alcantara's second of the game. And so the Marlins have a runner in scoring position. Can this be where they break the drought and cut into this lead? The only other player to get a base hit today is Jazz Chisholm, who's drove in Alcantara back in the first inning. And he will look to do it again. Jazz Chisholm rips it into left center. It will one hop off the wall. It'll go for a double. And it's now 10-2. to two. Chris Paul hits a huge three to cut the lead to 43. Painter will be taken out of the game. He'll be replaced by Christian McGowan, who the Phillies hope will take him the rest of the way. Great performance out of Painter, only allowing four hits. Two doubles by Alcantara and two doubles by Chisholm, ironically. Woody Landry with a base hit into right. Chisholm's going to look to score, being aggressive. What's there to lose down by eight? We'll make it seven, I guess, because he is safe. Given a normal situation, the Marlins would not have sent him there. But it paid off. He was safe. So Woody Landry drives in a run, and that'll bring you up Jesus Sanchez. He rips it into left field, and now the offense is really starting to get going. Now, unfortunately, the Marlins would not drive either of these runners in, but it's still good to see some fight from the offense as we go bottom seven. Same score. Brian De La Cruz in off the bench as a pinch hitter, draws a walk. That'll bring up Kevin Alcantara, one of the few guys who's actually played pretty well today, and he rips it into the gap looking for another hit. De La Cruz, rounding third, heads home. He will look to score from first, and he does. It's an RBI double for Kevin Alcantara, his 16th double of the season, and his third of the game, as it's now 10-4. Let's take a look at Joe Shearer, who had been pitching pretty well. He finally had a scoreless inning for the Marlins, but here in the eighth, the Phillies add to the lead with a solo home run by Rowdy Telez's 24th of the year. That's the first run that Shearer has allowed all season. He would make it through the rest of the inning, though, as he strikes out Matt Willard. But the Phillies do lead 11-4. They look like they should be able to finish this game off up by 7. Woody Landry's looking to drag the Marlins back into it as he launches a rocket 
into left center. That one is gone. And it's now 11 to 5. As I mentioned earlier, I feel like Woody Landry's really starting to play well here in the month of July. Not that he was playing poorly earlier, but he's really caught his stride this month now at 26 home runs. That'll bring up the catcher, MJ Melendez, with a full count. He rips this one to short. What a play by Trey Turner. I thought Turner was slowing down earlier in the game, but over the last few innings, his athleticism has been on full display. Phil Bickford out of the bullpen for the Marlins here in the ninth, the new addition. He would have a pretty good inning as the Phillies don't score. Finished off by a Bryce Harper line out to third. And Ringifo makes the play as we go bottom nine. Diego Castillo is in for the Philadelphia Phillies looking to finish off the game. They're up by six. Presumably they should get the job done. Full count here for De La Cruz. He hits it sharply into right and it will be caught. The Phillies take the first of a four-game set here in Miami, 11-5. Really strong win here for the Phillies. The offense was absolutely brilliant. I mean, they were dominant the entire game. 11 runs, 18 hits. They consistently got guys on base. They consistently got extra base hits. And between the second and the sixth inning, they looked utterly unstoppable. And we had no answer for them. The Phillies pitching was okay. I think Andrew Painter had a really good start for the most part, even though he allowed three runs. He was, for the most part, very good. The bullpen made it a little bit close there, but overall a good start from Painter. We need more out of the offense. We had some guys individually play well. Three doubles for Alcantara, two for Chisholm, Woody Landry homered. Those three guys were really good, but everybody else combined had one hit. Casey Mize was not good. He had eight strikeouts, though, impressively. The bullpen wasn't good either. I mean, it was just a pitching disaster. There's no other way to put it. So we're going to do some simulating now. Get through the rest of the series against the Phillies. Got to win a couple of those games. And then on the road, we've got the Rangers and the Reds leading us into a series against the Yankees. I kind of want to play against Sandy Alcantara. Before that, though, we have reached the deadline for draft pick signing. And I've been going through all of the draft pick stuff off camera. And I'm going to show you the process of doing it all now. Since we lost three players who we gave the qualifying offer to last year, we obviously had a bunch of extra compensatory picks, which is going to make it harder to sign everybody. Damian Ingebrigtsen, he ends up signing with us officially. Brandon Clark, a player I'm intrigued by a lot, ends up officially signing as well. Shinji Tanaka, the fourth rounder, says no. Alexander Boyer, our last pick, says yes. So through the first cycle, we would get three guys to sign. Edgar Benitez, our second round pick, is officially under contract. Enrique Armas we're having some trouble with, though. He has declined twice. We do get Tanaka to sign. Will this be the time we get Armas? Yes, it is. He signs with us now. So we're able to sign most of our guys for the most part. We don't get Russell Gelman here. The following day, we would get him to sign with us. And now we're down to three players with three days left until the deadline. Kareem Huerta signs, and now we have two left, including our first rounder, Kevin Schmidt. We have $2.85 million to spend, and these guys want a little over $3 million total. So the game made us low ball both of them, and they each ended up accepting. So we're able to sign everybody. I'm not sure how we did that, but all of our draft picks have signed. So here's a look at the final results. Kevin Schmidt ends up being pretty solid. Not a home run or anything, but I think he could be a solid reliever. Edgar Benitez, I'm very intrigued by, 86 potential. Kareem Huerta, I think, could be a pretty solid MLB-ready pitcher. Damian Ingebrigtsen looks good. Brennan Clark could be a fun bench bat, as I expected. Russell Gelman looks solid. Enrique Armas looks pretty good. I feel like our scouts overhyped him a little bit, but he still looks talented. And then Johnny Machado, 88 potential. I like that. While Tanaka and Boyer hopefully end up as good organizational depth. Before we take a look at the results of the games that have been simulated, I do want to point out that Josh Bell has officially been granted to us off of waivers. He's going to go right up to the big leagues, and we're going to send down Jacob Berry, not Alec Bohm. I want to send Berry down in particular because I think he needs more reps. He needs to get it together. He's just not hitting the ball that well. He had a really good season last year, but this year, he just hasn't been very good. We only ended up winning one out of four total against the Phillies, which is not ideal. We did go four and two after that, including a sweep of the Rangers, so five and four total. And of our five wins, we scored double-digit runs three times, including this game that we won 13 to 10. The Phillies scored seven in the top of the second. We got seven in the bottom half of the inning. Khalil Watson with his second multi-homer game of the last week. And despite a Tyrell Berry disaster class, we got the win. 
This game against Texas, we score 11. The offense continuing to dominate while Edward Cabrera had another great start per usual. And then the very next day, we scored 10, including 6 in the ninth inning. We have cooled off the last couple of games, though, and we haven't made up any ground against the Phillies. If anything, we've lost ground as we're now tied with them for first place. Before we end out the episode, I want to highlight Woody Landry. He's been phenomenal as of recent, and he actually put himself into the MVP race. He was in third at one point, with Jazz Chisholm being in first, but now Isaac Stu has passed everybody. He is back at the top. Jazz is back in second. I feel like it's going to be a five-horse race for the MVP, and four of the candidates are on our roster with these two, Woody, and I don't want to forget Edward Cabrera either. Last season, he was not in the MVP race until the very end, and he ended up winning the award. We've got four guys going for the MVP right now, which I think kind of shows where this team is at. Our star power has been phenomenal this season, but we need some of these lesser guys and these younger guys to really step up, and hopefully we can continue to get these youngsters to play well along with our new additions at the trade deadline. Let me know what you thought of our moves and our draft picks down below in the comments section. We've got a really tough schedule to wrap up August. We've got some great teams on the slate, including the Yankees, Astros, Dodgers, Padres, Rays. It's going to be a gauntlet of the month, and I'm excited to see if we can tackle it. Make sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel if you are new. Peace out.